Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, we'll be taking a look at several architecture patterns and the overall classification of those patterns. When we take a look at architecture patterns and styles, whether it be layered architecture, space-based microkernel, modular monolith, event-driven microservices, which is the ever-popular trend, service-based, and even pipeline architecture, we've got all these architecture styles and patterns available to us. And what I tend to like to do as an architect is to form these classifications of architecture styles. You know, my first attempt at doing this was to say, well, you know, all the trend and all the craze is on service kind of architectures. And so if we keep service-based architecture and microservices kind of on its own over there, and we have all these other component-based architecture, and what I mean by component-based means that we usually, as an architect, define components. And those components, those building blocks of the architecture, usually are what defines these kind of architectures and patterns. However, looking at this, there seem to be a little bit of odd kind of things happening because event-driven architecture, for example, and even space-based architecture tended to share some of the characteristics of service-based architecture and microservices. And by the same token, even things like service-based architecture and microservices still utilize components. I mean, they're still built utilizing and using components, building blocks of the architecture, a particularly space-based. So this quickly kind of fell apart. And when you're building a taxonomy, you want to try to find a really good seam between the different kinds of things you're trying to classify. And when I started to think about this, I realized, well, the clear division that seems to me between these are those kind of application styles that we can create that are monolithic. In other words, single deployable units of software, one big bulk of software we deploy, versus distributed architectures, which really have multiple deployable units that make up our application context. And this seemed like a really good separation. As a matter of fact, if you look at this seam, and you look at the differences between the characteristics and the issues associated with distributed architectures versus monolithic, it starts to become fairly clear that this is a good separation. For example, the whole idea of contracts within distributed architectures makes it fairly complex. In other words, I need some sort of contract because everything is a remote call, whether it be messaging or REST or some other kind of protocol. And that contract really describes what I am expected to get from you and what I'm expected to give back to you in terms of the type of data and the data types. And we all have to adhere to the same contract. However, when I change that contract, invariably, if I don't version anything, I break all the clients that are talking to me. And so this kind of versioning is the first thing that I realize really is a significant difference between monolithic and distributed architectures. You know, in monolithic, we have contracts. It may be a method call. But everything's tightly bound and everything's a compile time. So if I change the method signature, think about this. I won't compile because I'm calling you. But in a remote access, there is no compile time kind of error handling. And that's where this error kind of uh, uh, comes in. You know, the other thing is this remote service availability and service responsiveness. These are two different aspects we have to deal with when we enter into distributed architectures availability in terms of the fact that can you even receive my request? And then responsiveness. Yes, you have received my request, but you're not responding back to me. And so I need some sort of timeout value or circuit breakers to be able to deal with this kind of error handling. And this becomes a little bit complex in a distributed architecture, something we don't have to deal with in monolithic architectures. You know, the other difference that we take for granted, quite frankly, in monolithic architectures is the fact of this whole in-memory call. You know, when we instantiate or inject a class and invoke a method, we don't even think about it, quite frankly, because it's measured in microseconds. And I'm going to call that T local, the time of that local call. 
However, when we move to distributed architectures, pretty much everything is remote. And now we have to do deal with a latency, which is that time of remote call. And math does not lie that T remote will always be greater than T local. And this is something that necessarily we need to determine in our own kind of environments. This is something you cannot Google. Now, I usually use 100 milliseconds round trip and latency as kind of an example. I've seen as low as 67. I've seen as high as a 200 milliseconds in latency. But this is something we have to take into account when we start doing inner service communication and communicating between remote kinds of services. The third thing we have to deal with in the distributed world that we don't have to in monoliths is the whole idea of security. In other words, since everything is remote, I have no idea who's calling me and I want to try to prevent these bad clients from accessing me. And so I need to secure and also authorize all of these calls in between each of these remote points. And that becomes quite a challenge. Again, something we necessarily don't have to think about in our monolithic applications. When we talk about logging, usually this is a technology kind of a, a technical debt kind of concern that it's, oh yeah, that's infrastructure and such. And we usually don't worry about this in monolithic applications. But when we start to worry, when we start to move towards distributed architectures, we do have to worry about this because necessarily we have distributed logs everywhere. And to try to figure out, quote, the story of what happened to a particular transaction and why a claim wasn't routed or was, wasn't routed to the right agent or why an order was dropped, um, sometimes that troubleshooting is really difficult in a distributed environment. And so distributed logging kind of becomes at the forefront rather than pushed at the end in terms of technical debt. And the last thing we have to deal with is, of course, transactionality. You know, in monolithic applications, we take for granted the fact that we do update, update, delete, update, insert, oh, error, rollback. Well, the point is when we're propagating through remote access protocols, we can't feasibly propagate a transaction as well. And as a matter of fact, even technically, if you argue, well, there's some technical uh, loopholes I can do to do that, uh, to propagate a transaction, we wouldn't want to anyway, because this is a distributed environment. And so we have to deal with transactionality in terms of base transactions. Uh, base stands for basic availability, soft state, and eventual consistency, as opposed to the traditional ACID transactions, automicity, consistency, isolation, and durability that we're used to using. You know, when I think about these five basic challenges, this becomes a good delineation between an architecture style that you need to choose for your application. Do you go monolithic or do you go distributed? And once you make that decision, then you can tear down whether we're going to do event-driven or microkernel or microservices or space-based or pipeline and then kind of the hybrids that form between those. You know, you can get more information about some of these patterns by going to several places. All these references, by the way, on our, are on developer2architect.com, either in the articles, books, or videos um, sections there. But I, I've written a book on software architecture patterns and also microservices versus SOA. Both of these are free books from O'Reilly. Uh, my friend Neil Ford and I have recorded a lot of videos on software architecture fundamentals that cover some of these basic kind of patterns of architecture. And also I do, do have uh, training as well in software architecture fundamentals, live training, uh, both public and private courses that you can go to to also learn about these patterns in architecture in general. So this has been lesson six, classifying architecture patterns of Software Architecture Monday. Please stay tuned next week for lesson seven, where I'll be introducing another kind of technique in software architecture. Thank you so much and be sure and stay tuned.